الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن استن بسنته إلى يوم الدين All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day <coughs> The topic, the moderate Muslim, is particularly relevant to us in this time because of the fact that Muslims have been labeled globally as extremists. The religion of Islam is portrayed as a religion of extremism. And as such, we would be obliged to address this topic. Though, as a topic, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, had spoken about it 1,400 years ago. But the difference <clears throat> is that the context in which he spoke about it and the context in which it is used today are two different contexts. The intention behind the term moderate in the West is quite different from the intention behind moderate from the Prophet <clears throat> When we look at the original context, what it meant when the Prophet instructed us on so many different occasions through his companions, it meant a balance, a, a balanced Muslim, that we are conscious of neither being too far to the right or too far to the left, too high or too low. It was about a middle point. A middle point where the Ummah would be rightly guided and the religion would be easily practiced. Right guidance and easy practice we find repeated or repeatedly addressed by the Prophet in his Sunnah. <clears throat> we find an open statement Iyakum wal ghulu fiddin. Beware of extremism in the religion. He warned the companions not to be extreme. And he addressed a number of issues in order to clarify what he intended by avoiding extremism. He addressed himself 
telling the companions لا تتروني كما أطرطت النصارس عيسى بن مريم Do not be extreme in your praise of me because of course love of the Prophet ﷺ is a foundation of faith and he did tell us to love him more than anything in this world but at the same time that love should not go beyond the bounds that Islam has set. So while he said, La tu'minu ahadukum, hatta akuna ahabba ilayhi min walidihi wa waladihi wa nasi ajma'in, you do not truly believe until I become more beloved to you than your parents your children and all of humankind he at the same time said do not be excessive in your praise of me because what he meant by loving him was clarified in following him. It is a love which drives the believers to follow him as closely as possible. Not a love which would push them to worship him because that is the extreme. The love which pushes us to worship him is unacceptable. Though we consider it to be love, we may cry while we're doing it. We may feel emotionally involved. But still, that love is unacceptable. Because it was that love which led Christians to make Jesus alayhi salam God. That is the end, that is the farthest point that we can go with that love. Where they elevated him from being a human being to being the son of God who was himself God. So Allah had the Prophet وسلم, in the Quran state Qul innama ana basharum mithlukum Say, Allah tells the Prophet ﷺ to say, I am a human being like you. I'm a human being like you, just like you. As you are human beings, and you can never be God, I am likewise. Except that I have, re I have received revelation. That's what distinguishes me primarily, Prophet Muhammad is distinguished from the rest of humankind, like all of the prophets of Allah, by wahi, revelation. So, we are moderate in our belief, in our love of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when we keep that love within the confines of his humanity. So, we believe that he was a human being. 
A human being who was born and who died as all human beings do. To claim that he wasn't actually born as human beings are born, but he was in fact a part of the light of Allah. That it was the splitting of Allah's light, divine light, which brought him into being. And of course, the divine light is eternal. The light of Allah is eternal. So we are saying that in fact, he is eternal without beginning and without end. You see where this is headed. And to claim that he was infallible. Absolutely. He never made a single mistake. When infallibility, absolute infallibility belongs to Allah alone. That's one of the attributes of Allah. He makes no mistakes. And the Prophet ﷺ had said, Kullu bani Adam khatta. Every descendant of Adam, and the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ was among the descendants of Adam, makes mistakes. And the Prophet ﷺ used to make istighfar a hundred times a day, more. And he encouraged us to do the same. Seeking forgiveness. Seeking forgiveness. And Allah corrected him in the Quran with regards to the blind man who came and wanted to speak to him when he was going to see the leaders of Quraysh. And he turned away from him. And Allah told him, You shouldn't have done that. It was a mistake. And when he chose the opinion of Abu Bakr with regard to the prisoners of Badr to let them go instead of executing them as Umar ibn al-Khattab and others suggested, Allah corrected him that it wasn't befitting. So it's in front of us in the Quran itself. Not to mention other elements of the Sunnah where this comes out and clarifies for us that Muhammad was indeed a human being like us. So the moderate view is to keep him in his humanity. But at the same time, to honor him, to praise him, because of the revelation which was given to him, which elevated him as it elevated the prophets of Allah above the remainder of humankind. So, from the very beginning, the Prophet وسلم, was instructed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to emphasize his humanity in order to prevent people from going to the extreme with regards to his self. Who was your Prophet? 
That's the question that's asked in the grave of the three questions. Woman Nabiyuk. And who was your prophet? If your answer is that my prophet was my God, you have lost. If my prophet became my God, I worshipped him, we have lost. So therefore, it is not acceptable for us to direct prayers to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to call on him in prayer to make dua to him in prayer this is not acceptable and those who say the dua is not prayer <laughs> Well, the Prophet ﷺ authentically said, Ad-du'a huwa al-ibadah. Dua is in fact worship. So whoever we call on in prayer, whether it is Hassan and Hussein, or it's Ali and Fatima, or it's Sheikh Abdul Qadir Al Jilani. Whoever we call on in prayer, we are engaged in their worship, in worshiping them. They have become for us God. Allah has told us very clearly, Ud'uni astajib lakum. Call on me and I will answer your prayers. So where is there room for calling on others besides him? No matter what arguments are given, whether you are informed, listen, brother, you are dirty with sin. How in the world can you imagine that you can approach Allah with all this dirt this sin, when Allah is pure and good, and He only loves what is pure and good. You need to find somebody who is clean, a special individual, pure, who will carry your prayers to Allah for you. This is an argument. Just as if you want to see the president of the country, you can't just go and knock on his door and say, Mr. President, I'd like to have a discussion with you. No, you have to meet certain people from the party, ANC, and they have to tell you or help you get to the head of the party and the party talks to this person from the parliament and da 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 eventually your request will reach the president and it can be answered and of course that's how this world works we deal in intermediaries we have intermediaries between ourselves and the higher ups so that might sound very logical. However, Allah said, Ud'uni astajib laku. Call on me, not on somebody close to me. Call on me and I will answer you. So there is no need for anyone between ourselves and Allah. Allah has given us a direct connection direct line so to go to others is ghulu this is extremism so extremism comes in a variety of different forms 
It can come in our beliefs. It can come in our practices. It can come in our behavior, how we treat our fellow human beings, how we treat animals. Because Muslims know that there are issues concerning dogs, for example, <coughs> we shun dogs. We keep them away from us. Our children will run into any time any dogs come. Of course, the non-Muslims, they look at us, you know. As soon as somebody comes to a dog, every Muslim is running in every direction, right? <laughs> and they wonder, what is it about these Muslims and dogs, really? You know, they can't quite understand it. But this is where we have gone to extremes. Yes. The other extreme is to bring the dog into your bed with you, to give the dog clothing when you walk around with him, to give him a kiss before you go to bed at night, and when you wake up in the morning, yeah, that's the other extreme. Okay, that's the other extreme that Western society goes to. But we don't need to go to that other extreme either. Where we're running away from dogs, you know, as if if a dog touches you, anyhow, ah, your day is ruined. <laughs> a dog touched me. <clears throat> the Prophet ﷺ, he did tell us not to keep the dogs in our homes. You know, it reduces baraka. Blessings are lost from keeping the dogs that close. But he allowed herding dogs that herd the camels, herd sheep, herd goats, which help those who raise cattle, etc. He allowed it. He allowed hunting dogs, mentioned in the Quran, Mukallabin. Mentioned in the Quran, hunting dogs. How does a dog learn to hunt? If you think about it, is the dog from birth a hunting dog? No, he has to be trained. How do you train him? If you don't have to touch him, and of course, you have to. To train him that after you've killed the animal, he'll just run there, catch the animal, and bring it back to you. Not eat it. His nature, he is born, the nature which he's born with, teaches him or makes him eat that animal. When he catches an animal, which is edible, he eats it. That's his nature. But you have trained him not to eat it. How do you think that happens? By giving him instructions. Listen, doggy, you just don't eat that bird. <laughs> no. Instructions are not going to work. You have to train him. You have to you know, feed him in a special way. You have to be in close contact with him to give him that training. So even those people who say, OK, but if the dog licks you, you know, what do you do now? You have to go wash your hand seven times. One of the times you should use some earth to. No. This is not what the Prophet ﷺ instructed us to do. That's for the plates, the cups, the glasses. If you leave your glass or cup and he comes along, it's, it's nature. If he's thirsty, if he's hungry, he will eat. So he sticks his mouth into your glass and he licks up some water. Now what do you have to do? Let him finish. If it's food, etc., let him finish. Finish it. Then wash it seven times, yes. 
one of the times with clean earth. This is the instruction of the Prophet ﷺ. For that occasion, it doesn't mean if he licks you, licks your hand, you now have to do the same. He said, for your vessels. See, again, this is the extreme. Now, it's anything he licks. It becomes, it, you have to go clean this now. He licks your clothes. Oh, no. No. This is extreme. These are the extremes. And the religion of Islam is a middle path. وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطَى Allah said, I made you a middle nation between one extreme and the other to find that middle path. And we have examples from the time of the Prophet Wasallam. I'm sure you've all heard it many times. The companions who came to the wives of the Prophet Wasallam and asked them about the Prophet Wasallam's ibadah. How he used to pray. How he used to fast. And when they told him, and they heard that he was normal, they said, oh, but Allah has forgiven his sins. So he can just live a normal life. We need to do more. So one of them said, I'm going to fast every day. Every day. The other one said, I'm going to stay up in prayer all night. The third one said, I'm not going to get married. When the Prophet ﷺ came and he heard about these individuals and what they expressed, this was their intent to try to practice the deen as best as they could. See, this was not an evil intent. They were not seeking worship. They were not trying to worship him here. They, were ju they just felt that they needed to do more. Because his sins were already forgiven. Allah forgave his sins. And the Prophet ﷺ, after he heard that, he said, he called them, called the people, and he said, listen, I don't fast every day. I fast, and I break my fast. And I don't stay awake all night. I sleep, and I pray in the night, middle of the night. And I marry women. On another occasion, he said, what's most beloved to me in this world are what? What are they? The two things. Perfume and women. Ah, a'udhu billah. <laughs> the Prophet ﷺ loved women. A'udhu billah. How can you say that? <laughs> the Prophet ﷺ said it. The Prophet ﷺ said it. So he clarified that that approach is an extreme approach. We stay within his way. That is the moderate way. So at the end of it all, he said, فَمَنْ رَغِبَ عَنْ سُنَّتِي فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي And whoever loves a sunnah other than mine is not a true follower of me. Choosing another sunnah instead of the sunnah which Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu brought another way is evidence of not being a true follower. Although the person might feel, I love the Prophet Sallallahu I love him so much that Christians who love Jesus celebrate his birthday on the 25th of December. 
or if you're Eastern Orthodox, on the 6th of January. Yeah. Maybe you didn't know that, yeah. There are millions and millions of Christians from the Eastern Orthodox who celebrate the birthday of Prophet Jesus. For them, it's God on the 6th of January. In January instead of December. Anyway, the point is that we have those who say, if they could love Jesus so much that they would celebrate his birthday, then surely Prophet Muhammad's birthday should be celebrated even more. This is the logic. People have this logic. But reality is, do we love Rasulullah more than his Sahaba loved him? No. No way. They lived with him. They ate with him. They fought with him. Alongside him, not against him. Alongside him. So they loved him. But they didn't celebrate his birthday. So how can somebody come along today and say, you don't love Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You and all you Wahhabis <laughs> don't love Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because you don't celebrate his birthday. This doesn't make sense. We love Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by following him. In kuntum tuhibbun Allah, if you love Allah, Allah said, follow the Prophet وسلم, and Allah will love you. If that's what we seek ultimately, the love of Allah, then we are to follow Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. To love him and celebrate his birthday as a display of our love, this is from Hulu. It doesn't mean we don't say, okay, those people who celebrate his birthday are disbelievers. Kuffar. That's also Hulu. That's also Hulu. We say, yeah, this is an op you know, opinion that you have, but you need to think it out. It's not really correct. It's incorrect. But Allah could forgive them can forgive them if it's done in ignorance and all other factors so we should not go to the other extreme of takfir we have to be very careful with takfir declaring Muslims to be disbelievers and non-Muslims that is ghulu and the Prophet ﷺ warned us against that he warned us not to declare another Muslim a non-Muslim. We wouldn't do that. Because if we do it, it will be applicable to either one or the other. If it's not applicable to the person that you called, then you fall into a state of disbelief for having done it. Not necessarily per permanent state, but Nonetheless, you have committed an act of disbelief. So, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ were trained in moderation. And whenever they saw things going into extremism, they would step in and try to stop it. So when in the time of Omar ibn al-Khattab, people were... <coughs> visiting the tree under which Bayatul Ridwan had taken place or believed to have taken place. People started to visit it in larger and larger numbers, making special prayers there. 
What did Omar ibn al-Khattab do? He chopped it down. Chopped it down. People, people today might say, how could he do that? That was the tree under which Prophet Muhammad gave bay'at to the companions for committing themselves to go fight for Uthman anhu, when the me message came that he had been killed by the kuffar in Mecca. <coughs> Omar ibn Khattab cut that tree down. And when he was making Hajj, Tawaf, and he stopped, and of course people stopped, slowed down, observing him, and he addressed the black stone. And don't believe that he was actually talking to the black stone. Right? That's Golu. He addressed the black stone, but really he was addressing all of the people there that could hear him. And he said, I know you are only a stone. Hajar al-Aswad. You are only a stone. You cannot do any good for me, nor can you harm me. And the only reason why I am kissing you is because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kissed you. Today, what are we doing? We are fighting to get to the stone. Maybe we hurt how many Muslims around us fighting to get to the stone. And we are rubbing the stone and rubbing it on ourselves. You know, if your brother came along with you with your baby, hand me the baby, take the baby, rub the baby on the stone and take it back. <laughs> you know, that's where we've gone. We've gone somewhere else. We believe that that black stone has power. But that's Hulu. So we need to follow the instructions of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with regards to the implementation of the religion. His instructions call to moderation and ease with the religion. Ad-Dinu Yusr, he said, the religion is easy. Ad-Dinu Yusr. Today, if you want to join your prayers or not fast while traveling, People will tell you, why, brother? It's better for you to fast. Pray your prayers in their correct times. We're not in the time of the Prophet ﷺ where people, you know, had to walk, ride camels to cover these distances. You're flying in an airplane, you're just relaxing. So why? But the Prophet ﷺ had said, Yassiru wa la tu'asiru. Make things easy for people. Don't make it difficult. He said that. And when his companions didn't want to break the fast traveling, he broke the fast in front of them for them to see. But today, we will intervene with what the Prophet ﷺ has given us, using our rationale to say this is only something you can do when there's time of difficulty. But that's not. If it were concessions only for times of difficulty, then the Prophet ﷺ would have told us. Because the religion was not just for his time, it was for all times. That's the point. If you choose to fast, if you choose to pray your prayers, it's not haram. But know that if you fast, you don't get more reward 
than the one who didn't fast following the instructions of the Prophet And know that if you pray your prayers in their times, you don't get more reward than the person who prays the prayers together. You'll get your reward for praying. And you will get your reward for fasting. But it won't be more than the one who didn't fast, taking the concession which Allah gave and which the Prophet ﷺ encouraged us to take. That's the bottom line. It's permissible. But it's not worth more. So, the Prophet ﷺ was known that whenever he was given a choice between two things, which were both halal, acts or objects, etc., he would take the easier one. If somebody sees you doing that, you're always taking the easy. He said, brother, come on, man. You're, you're destroying your deen. You're always taking the easy way. <laughs> but that was the way of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He took the easy way when he had a choice between two things which were halal. And in this way, the religion becomes easy. And we can understand when the Prophet ﷺ told us, he spoke to Bilal radiallahu anhu, saying, Arihna bis salaya Bilal. Give us relaxation by calling for the prayer, O Bilal. That the prayer was relaxation. For us, the prayer is a burden. Not relaxation. It's inconvenience. So today, when the time for prayer comes and we start to pray, most of us are praying a mile a minute. <laughs> you know, that, this kind of prayer. I've even seen people, they're making sujood, they will just tap their head twice on the ground, just tap, tap. That's it. They don't even sit back up after sujood. While still down there once, twice, okay, done. Why? Because the Salah is a burden. Sujood is a burden. But the Prophet Sallallahu had said, Arihna bis Salah ya Bilal. It's supposed to be Raha. Rest. Relaxation. Coming into the presence of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. His rahma, his knowledge, his power. Submitting ourselves, giving in to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are supposed to find rest. Allah bi dhikrillahi tatma'inna al It is only with the remembrance of Allah that hearts find rest. And the, that is in the context that Allah said, Aqimu salah li dhikri. Establish the prayer in order to remember me. So it is in that remembrance that the hearts find rest. This is what we have understood from the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he told us. In closing, looking at these examples, in Allah Halam Yabathani Muannitan, Walla Mutaannitan, Wallakin Baathani Muallimen Muyasira. Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala did not send me as a troublemaker to put trouble into your life inflexibly, not giving you room to maneuver. 
just this one way. Exactly. Because this is another extreme. Where people find out from the deen, Rasulullah did this, he did that, he did the other. It's okay, now we've got to do it exactly this. And anybody else who's not doing it exactly how I found out to do it, then we treat them as not true Muslims. They're playing with their deen. But reality is that the Prophet ﷺ did things, a lot of the things concerning salah, you know, uh, fasting, etc. He did it, Hajj, in a number of different ways. He left flexibility there. So yes, there is one way. Ma ana alayhi wa ashabi. What I'm following and what my companions followed. He explained it. That's the way. But that way is not a narrow tightrope where that you can fall off by just making one step, you're off. No, it's wide. Enough to absorb the variations which the Prophet ﷺ left for us to give us that flexibility. This is the moderate Muslim. However, our times, the term moderate Muslim has changed in its meaning. The moderate Muslim has been redefined for us. It's no longer that person who is practicing the deen as consistently and as accurately as he or she can, keeping in mind the flexibility in that practice which Rasulullah gave us, it now becomes a liberal Muslim. A liberal Muslim. And you hear that meaning, that term, more and more. To be liberal, Liberal coming from liber, which means free. Being free from the requirements of the religion. That's what it now comes to mean. From the Western perspective, the moderate Muslim is the one who will sit at the table with them and drink alcohol along with them. Will have girlfriends. Will hug their neighbor. Hmm? The neighbor means well in the West. He comes over to visit you as soon as you move into the house, he and his wife. And the wife comes running up to you to hug you, and he grabs your wife. <laughs> That's their way. It's showing welcome. And the fact that you're not willing to go along with the custom is extreme. You are now an extremist. But no, you are only trying to follow the basic principles of deen. You are not touching women, hugging women. Nor do you want your woman hugged or touched. That is the deen. So it has been redefined, especially after 9-11. And I remember seeing an article in the New York Times after 9-11 because Bush had said that this act was not the act of true Muslims. Islam is a religion of peace. It was the act of terrorists and extremists. And we're going to go get those terrorists and extremists. Actually, that was a wonderful dawah speech for us. If we had offered him, say, please, can you say this for us? <laughs> hey, no matter how much money you offered him, he would never say it. You know? It's Allah's qadr. He was put there and he made a stunning speech 
something which caused many Americans to question what they had understood of what Muslims were because at that point already you know the control of the media was so much into the hands of the Jews that we were presented continuously in the movies of the 90s as suicide bombers, you know, terrorists. Every movie would have somebody. Somebody would say, Allah Akbar, he stabs somebody. Allah Akbar, he blows up something. It was just, all of the movies of that time came like that. So here was President Bush saying, this was not the act of true Muslims, proper Muslims. This word, terrorists. Islam is a religion of peace. Oh, jazakumullahu <laughs> khairah. So many Americans at that point, when they heard this, they said, hey, this is contrary to what we've been seeing in the movies, reading in the magazines, you know, seeing on TV and all this. So they called up Islamic centers. After that statement, the, the telephone lines of Islamic centers across America were just buzzing. People were calling up, calling up. Can you come to our, our church and explain to us about this Islam? We had an opportunity to spread Islam at that time like no opportunity before. And truly, the number of people who accepted Islam after 9-11, and I'm not saying this to say, well, 9-11 was a good thing. No, it was haram. It was evil. But this is the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that from an act so evil, he can take from it good. The numbers of people who accepted Islam were five times to ten times in different places more than were accepting Islam before. And people have been constantly accepting Islam in America in greater and greater numbers. After 9-11, it jumped. Qur'ans were bought from all the stores till you couldn't find copies of the Qur'an. Qur'an reached the top of the bestseller list in America. For about three years after 9-11, it remained top of the bestseller list. Imagine that. But that didn't make the act a good thing. Those people who are in fact extremists, they say, see, it was a good thing. All those people accepted Islam because of what we did. It was a good thing. No. No, no. What you did was evil. And your call to it is evil. The fact that Allah took good from it, that is Allahu Akbar. That's it. Allah is able to take from the worst of circumstances good. So, when this happened in the middle of all this, New York Times does this major article which says how to know a Muslim terrorist, extremist, potential terrorist, extremist, basically. How to know the Muslim extremist. Since President Bush said this was not the act of proper Muslims, good Muslims, this was the act of extremists and terrorists. So they say, okay, how do we know the difference? My neighbor, the owner of the shop, 9-11, 7-11, 7-11 down the street. A lot of Arabs there, you know, owning these shops, they're selling, making money. How do we know them from who? They said, okay, here are the lists. He prays five times a day. <laughs> He fasts every Ramadan. He doesn't shake the hands of women. Extreme. He won't sit at the table where alcohol is being drunk. 
They listed what a practicing Muslim is supposed to do under the heading of how to know an extremist Muslim from a moderate Muslim. So they changed the paradigm. They had a different meaning now to moderate Muslim. Moderate Muslim meant a free Muslim. As you have liberal Jews, you have orthodox Jews. Well, let's say we have orthodox Muslims who are the extreme ones. They're going to try to practice everything. And the liberal Muslims who are free. They practice of Islam, what is convenient to them, what's comfortable, you do it, what's not, you don't. You pick and choose as you like. And that's your right. It's religion. It's personal. It's between you and God. So that became the meaning of the moderate Muslim. One who was free to speak openly about anything. When he is confronted with the fact that Aisha radiallahu anha was married to the Prophet sallam, at the age of seven, she went to live with him at the age of nine. Audhu billah. He can't take that. No, 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 no. Either he goes to another extreme to say, no, no, actually she was 19, not nine. There's mistakes. These hadiths, we can't trust them. Sahih Bukhari. No, even Sahih Bukhari, we can't trust them. Or, on the other hand, he is not only free to speak, He's free to act. Riba. No problem. I get my house on mortgage. I put my money in the bank and collect the interest. No problem. And so on and so forth. So they redesigned Islam. From the moderate, liberal Muslim as the ideal who should be supported. The Rand Corporation, they put out a report on the Muslim world, Muslim movements, etc. The moderate Muslim should be aided by the Western governments. And those who are conservative, the other end of the spectrum, they should be isolated. So, this is the challenge that we face today. A challenge of maintaining moderation according to how Prophet Muhammad وسلم, taught. Understanding his definition of moderation and living in accordance with it. Sticking with the Quran and the Sunnah. As the Prophet ﷺ said, we would never go, to go astray if we hold on firmly to them. Following the Khulafa al-Rashidin, al-Mahdiyin, the guided, rightly guided caliphs, following their example, and that of the Sahaba, the best generation. Ma'ana alayhi wa ashabi. What I am following, the Prophet said, and my companions. And we maintain that moderation when we understand Islam through their eyes. Because they were closest to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi And that is why Imam Malik had said, whatever was not religion, when the verse, Al Yoma Akmeltu Lakum Dinakum, today I have completed for you your religion, can never be a part of the religion. Never, ever. 
The moderation lies in following the religion that was revealed when that verse was revealed. Not going beyond its bounds, not decreasing it, but finding the middle path between excess and deficiency. Finding the middle path between extreme love and ignorance. Knowledge about which Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had said, Talabul ilmi farida ala kulli Muslim, seeking knowledge is compulsory for every Muslim. Seeking that knowledge and practicing the deen according to the knowledge, that is moderation. Practicing the deen simply according to what my parents did, what my grandparents did, my great-grandparents did. When revelation didn't come to them, that is extreme. To say, I'm just going to follow what they did, that is extreme. It may be comfortable, because you you're not required to go and check things out, find out what is and what isn't, etc. You just go with the flow. But that, though it might seem easy, that in fact is extreme. The ease comes in knowing what actually is the deen and f following it. There is the real ease. You have peace of mind knowing that you are following Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the best way that you can. And with that, I conclude reminding you and reminding myself to follow that middle path. And we seek forgiveness from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala from having gone astray from that path. And we ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to help us to make that path clear to our children and our families. And I ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to uplift this ummah through following the moderate path as defined for us by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Barakallahu Fikum. Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Seeking knowledge and obligation made easy. Thought about studying for a long time? Tuition fees keeping you from actually starting? Islamic Online University has led a revolution in online learning. The world's first tuition-free degree, BA in Islamic Studies. Access to the knowledge, any place, anytime, anywhere. It just doesn't get any easier than that. Classes, texts, assignments, completely online. Set your own schedule for the semester. No overseas travel required for the exams. Subjects taught by qualified English-speaking scholars. Weekly live sessions in virtual classrooms. With curricula based on those in El Medina University in Saudi Arabia. El Azhar University in Cairo. And other reputable institutions around the world. Why wait any longer? You pay just a symbolic registration fee and are ready to begin the adventure of higher education. The most diverse student body of any university in the world, 130,000 plus registered students from 217 countries. Log in to the website for more details, www.islamiconlineuniversity.com.